Now, since we know the relationship between afferent, which are sensory, and efferent, which are motor, those particular divisions, let's start with the muscle spindles. They are concentrated primarily in the belly of the muscle between all the muscle fibers. They are sensitive to stretch, and more importantly, they're sensitive to the rate of stretch, or how fast the muscle is being lengthened. They are inserted into the connective tissue within the muscle and run parallel with these muscle fibers. So if you look at a, a bundle of muscle fibers, and they're actually wrapped around the ends of these muscle fibers, so when the muscle starts to stretch, they pick up these uh, these uh, signals that the muscle is being stretched, but being stretched too rapidly and too long. The muscle spindle varies depending on the level of uh, control that is needed. So a good, uh, a good example of that is there are more concentration and muscle spindles in the hands than there are the thighs. Because these, the, the thighs, like the quadriceps and the hamstrings, those are more for gross motor movements, but the hands, need a lot of proprioception and a kinesthetic uh, feedback because of the fact that they're fine motor control units. Now, the muscle spindles is what they call the myotatic and, or the stretch reflex. They monitor rep when, you know, rapid muscle stretching. So when rapid muscle stretch occurs, it sends an impulse to the CNS. It's like we just talked about in the last slide. You can see where they're inserted at between the muscle fibers, and they kind of wrap themselves around that. So if you look at that, the muscle will stretch, and it picks up these signals saying the muscle's being stretched too long or too fast. Now, it will send the signal back to the CNS, and the CNS activates motor neurons to, to send a signal back to the muscle to force it to contract. So it, so it over offsets that rapid stretching. An example of that is the knee jerk or patella tendon reflex. So let's actually go to the next slide because all it does when you strike the patella tendon where it inserts at and stretch rapidly, you'll get a knee jerk reaction. And this is what this slide's all about. Now the more sudden the tap though, the harder you hit it, the more forceful and faster you'll get a bigger reaction. So let's look at this. Sitting down, you'll, the quadricep will cross the knee joint into the uh, tibial tuberosity, where the, where, where the um, quadricep muscle will insert it, the patellar tendon. Now, when you hit that tendon and stretch it rapidly, it'll pick up the muscle here because it stretches the muscle. Even tapping down here, it stretches that muscle. So what it does is sends a signal back to the spinal cord, and then it'll say, say it'll tell the central nervous system it's contracting, it's lengthening too fast. Then it sends a signal back to the motor, on the, the motor neuron to the muscle, and then it will contract. There's where that there's where that twitch is, or you see the the leg will jerk and try to extend rapidly. Now the stretch reflex may be utilized to facilitate a greater response. Like a quick short uh, squat before um, a jump movement. Now you can try to jump from here, you know, you're not going to get very far. But if you rapidly stretch the muscles as you come down, what's happening? We're bending over, we're bending the knees, but sticking the hip backs and really lengthening the hamstrings. You do it rapidly. But if you do that, it sends a signal that so you're stretching the muscles real fast, sends a signal back, and then you go, it's a counter movement. You come down, then you get a counter movement, the hamstrings will contract, then as you come forward, the trunk extends, the knees come forward, and what happens to the quads? It gets a rapid stretch too, and then it sends a signal back to extend, and it's what they call a triple extension. And the quick stretch placed in the muscles in the squat enables the same muscles to generate more force in a subsequent jumping movement off the floor. This is a trained and learned response. Now the Golgi tendon organ is a little different. It's found serially, you know, serially, 
One here, one here, one here in series. And it's close to the muscle tendon junction. It's sensitive to both muscle tension, how much force is being developed or tension being developed, and active contraction. So much less sensitive to stretch than the muscle spindles. But we're going to focus on this. Sensitive to both muscle tension and active contraction. Requires a greater stretch to be activated. Now the tension in the tendons and the Golgi tendon organ increases as muscle contraction which activates the GTO. Now the GTO stress threshold is reached. You know, you're trying to produce a lot of force, but if there's not a lot, of, if it's too much and there's too much tension being created in the muscle tendon junction, it activates the GTO. The CNS causes the muscle to relax. It facilitates activation of the agonist as a protective mechanism. The GTO protects us from excessive contraction by causing the muscle to relax. It's like a reset. And it's, it can be reset with continued training. So let's give an example. Take the bench off and you bring it down and you try to push back up but it won't move because maybe you haven't trained long enough and that muscle is not strong enough to be able to produce enough force to move that weight. Because remember too, when you train muscle, the, the tendon, uh, the, the adaptation of the tendon to get stronger and thicker lags behind. So what happens is even if there's not enough force for that muscle to contract against that resistance, it's good. the body's going to say, hey, this is too much tension, this muscle. It's, it's too much tension. It can't handle it. So what happens is it shuts it down. That's exactly what it does. However, as you continue training, this GTO can be reset. It's actually set very conservatively, but with more and more training, it offsets it so we can produce more and more force, especially as not only the muscle adapts to produce more force, to build more actin and myosin filaments, but it also has a chance for, when you train for the connective tissue, especially the tendons, to get thicker and stronger to be able to handle more force, so when the muscle contracts, it can pull the bone, it can handle that type of stress or force. And uh, Pacinian corpuscles, they're concentrated around the joint capsules, the ligaments that surround the joint, the tendons sheaths, and beneath the skin. They're activated by rapid changes in joint angles and by the pressure changes affecting that capsule. So every time you change the angle of a joint or move it a certain way, whether it's, it doesn't matter what joint, these things will activate it since the pressure changes in there. But the activation is only lasts briefly and is not, and not effective in detecting constant pressure within the joint. But it does tell us, okay, if you're in this position, there's tension building up or pressure building up in that joint. Once again, it's that sensory input to our, for our proprioception for kinesthetic awareness. It's helpful in providing feedback regarding the location of a body part in space following quick movements such as running or jumping. So if you're running or even like lateral movements, you're, you're trying to decelerate and you put your foot out and you decelerate and then you change direction. That sensory action in this particular corpuscle will sense as you're changing direction about the type of pressure that's within the joint. The Ruffini's corpuscles, they're located in deep layers in the skin and in the joint capsule. They're activated by strong sudden joint movements as well as pressure changes. So if the joint changes suddenly, the pressure is going to change as well too, but so is the angle of the joint and where it's at. Reaction to pressure changes are slower to develop though. Now the Ruffini's corpuscles, activation is continued as long as pressure is maintained. It's essential in detecting minute joint position changes and providing information as to the exact joint angle. So if you're moving anywhere, moving and the joint angle changes and then you rotate and you see, you know, the, the extension of the knee might be, it's only supposed to be flexion extension, but it does do some rolling in there rolling this way and goes from side to side. 
So it will detect those pressure changes in there to say, am I in the right position or not? Now, the quality of movement in reaction to position changes is all dependent upon proprioceptive feedback from muscles and joints. Keep that in mind. Well, muscles can't activate, but if we're in the right position, how are we gonna know we're in the right position if we don't get this type of feedback from all these proprioceptors? Proprioception may be enhanced through specific training. So if you keep training a movement pattern and you keep doing the movement pattern correctly, your body will know exactly when that joint is in the right position. We tell people when they do squats all the time too, that when you're doing squat, you shouldn't let the knees buckle in or bend over too much around the back because the joints and everything should be lined up appropriately. And if you're in the right position, your body will learn that this is the right position. We tell people all the time to get a sense of the right position. When they do it right, we tell them and to remember that and keep trying to train in that position because they get the feedback and they know exactly what to do and they get faster and better uh, adaptations. Now, we're gonna talk about the all or none principle. When muscle contracts, contraction occurs at the muscle fiber level within a particular unit. So you get a contraction, a motor unit, and all the fibers that it, all the fibers that it attaches to. So the motor unit, single motor unit, and all the fibers that innervates, what we just talked about. So here you got a motor neuron and all the axon branches that attach to all the different fibers. It functions as one, as one single unit. That's why it's called a motor unit. A motor neuron and all the motor muscle fibers attached to is called a motor unit. Typical muscle contraction is the number of motor units responding and the number of muscle fibers that's contracting within the muscle may vary significantly from relatively few to virtually all muscle fibers. Now, depending on the number of uh, muscle fibers within each activated motor unit and the number of motor units activated. So if we have a very light move, uh, very light movement for just lifting our arm up like that, it's not going to recruit a lot of motor units because you don't need a lot of fibers just to move the elbow like that, do elbow flexion. But if you have a weight in your hand, it's going to try to recruit more and more motor units because you need more muscle fibers to contract, to produce force, to make that motion happen. Kind of like in this particular case, you know, you just tap on your toe, you only need a few fibers to do that. But if you're running, you're gonna need a lot of motor units to cause that movement to uh, happen effectively. Now the all or none principle, regardless of, of number, individual muscle fibers within a given motor unit will either fire or they won't. So if you activate that motor unit, depending on the type of stimulus you need, either, this, either if you activate that motor unit, all the muscle fibers are gonna, be, are gonna fire or they're not gonna activate at all. It's either all or none. That's why they call it this type of principle. You can't just, you know, if you've got uh, uh, 50 um, muscle fibers attached to one motor neuron, you can't just get, you know, individual muscle fibers to, to fire. When that motor unit and motor neuron is activated, all the fibers activate. Now the difference between lifting a minimal or versus maximum amount resistance is the number of muscle fibers recruited, which we just talked about. Now the number of muscle fibers recruited may be increased by activating these motor units, getting a greater number of muscle fibers. So what happens is the heavier you got, the heavier weight you have in your hand or pushing against the ground, or if you got a weight on your back and you're trying to push up, if it's a heavy weight, you're automatically gonna to try to recruit as many motor units as possible with more muscle fibers. So if you look at it, a gross, uh, gross motor units, the, the very large one, have up to like a thousand fibers per, per motor unit. So you want as many of those as you can to lift that. But if you've got a light weight, you're only gonna need a little bit of movement you know, a little bit of uh, motor unit recruitment and a few fibers to, to make that motion happen. So you can activate the larger motor units or you can activate more motor units. 
or you can try to make that movement happen faster and this increases the frequency of motor unit activation. So that's why if you're doing a real heavy squat, you see them come down control and when they come back up, they're not trying to go slow, they're trying to reverse that direction real fast. Because if you push really fast and hard against that barbell, guess what? You're gonna increase not only the number of motor units recruited, but you're also gonna increase the, uh, the frequency of motor unit activation as well. The number of fibers per motor unit varies substantially. So if you look at the eye, you've got small motor units with just maybe up to like 10 fibers per motor unit because it's fine motor control. But if you look at the larger muscles, they may have motor units with up to as much as a few thousand in just attached to that one motor unit. So we go from uh, gross motor movements to fine motor units, or what they call less complex activities, you know, such as, such as the quadricep, that's for the large. Less complex, they're gross motor units versus fine motor, gross, uh, fine uh, motor control versus gross motor control. Now the motor unit first receives a stimulus via the electrical signal and knows as an action potential. That's for the muscle fibers and the motor in the unit to contract. So it receives a signal. So if you're trying to move something, the brain says, okay, fire this. It sends a signal down to that motor unit and tries to contract, tries to stimulate all those muscle fibers. This is called a sub-threshold stimulus. Now most of the time when you're trying to move something initially, if, if you're not conscious of how fast to recruit that, if you're trying to go slow, it's going to start with the smallest motor units first, then, walk, then work up to the larger motor units. So that would be a sub-threshold uh, stimulus. So it's not strong enough to cause an action potential. In other words, if the signal isn't strong enough to make a twitch in the muscle, it won't do anything. It doesn't result in a contraction. Now the threshold stimulus, stimulus becomes strong enough to produce an action potential in a single motor axon. So if you look, remember, we have the cell body and the axon and the, all the fibers that are attached to. If it's strong enough, it'll produce an action potential in a, throughout that axon to go to the fibers to make them contract. And all the muscle, remember all the fibers in that motor unit will fire. They'll contract. Like I said, some maximum stimuli, stimuli that are strong enough to produce an action potential in additional motor units. Now maximum stimuli, where stimuli are strong enough to produce action potential in all of the motor units of a particular muscle. So if you look at a muscle, it may have quite a number of motor units attached to it, but in a sub maximum threshold, you know, you may not get all of them firing, but what you want to do, so you get a uh, sub threshold stimulus that may cause maybe one motor unit to do it, but then you've got sub maximal where they produce action potentials in other motor units or additional ones, and the maximum, which means you're trying to get all the motor units in that muscle to fire to, to cause action. Now, as the stimulus strength increases from the threshold stimulus, so you got a sub-threshold where you got nothing, you got a threshold stimulus, one motor unit responds. So if you increase that threshold up to maximum, more motor units are recruited and overall contraction force increases in a great infection. Sub-threshold, nothing. It's not strong enough to even get a twitch. But if you get enough electrical activity, it'll go in there and one motor unit may respond. Then if you keep doing it, you get more and more motor units to fire, and this is that sub-maximum stimuli, which you go from maybe one to four to eight motor units being, being fired or, or uh, being activated. Then you get to the maximum stimulus when all the muscle unit, all the motor units are being stimulated all at once. But this happens in a graded fashion. Now the graded contraction force may all be activated by increasing the frequency of motor unit activation, what we just talked about as well. 
Now the phases of a single muscle fiber contraction are twitch. With a stimulus, a latent period, a contract, con contraction phase, and then a relaxation phase. These are the phases within a single fiber contraction. So you got latent period, but there's, there's hardly anything going on at all. It's a brief period of a few milliseconds following the stimulus. It actually gets stimulus and it relaxes. Stimulus, relax. You get, then you get the contraction phase after the latent period. This is a muscle fiber begins to shorten. Lasts about 40 milliseconds. Then the relaxation phase, it follows a contraction phase, and it usually lasts about 50 milliseconds. So you can see, you get a stimulus, then you get a contraction, then a relaxation period. But it doesn't last, it's just about 100 milliseconds total. Now the summation is when successive stimuli, or what we just saw, latent period, contraction, relaxation. Successive stimuli provided before relaxation phase of the first twitch has been completed. So if you get a latent period, a contraction, and before it relaxes, you get another twitch right there. So before it, before it relaxes, you get another stimulus, and then another stimulus, and then another stimulus. This generates a greater amount of tension than one single contraction would produce individually. Now, if you keep doing that, you get a higher frequency, trying to move something really fast, and trying to move it as fast as possible with as much force as possible will increase the frequency of stimuli being stimulated. So that's what tetanus is. So you get simple twitches and then you get the summation of all those twitches together. So it results in the stimuli provided at a frequency high enough that no relaxation can occur between contractions. So if you do something and relax, do something relax. But what if you just keep trying to do it and try to move it as fast and hard as possible? You get those twitches, they're all summed together, then you get tetanus, which means it's firing constantly. Now trepe is what we just, kind of like what we saw before, it occurs when multiple maximum stimuli provided at low enough, low enough frequencies to allow complete relaxation between, between contractions to rested muscle. Slightly greater tension is produced between the second and third one. So you try to produce a contraction, relax, con produce a contraction, relax. But as each one goes along, the stimulus is greater and greater and greater. And finally, you get constant, you get constant tension on that particular fiber or muscle. Let's say the fourth second, third, fourth one are even greater than the first. It's a staircase effect. Resultant contractions are after the initial one results in an equal tension being produced. After they're all summed together, boom. Now let's talk about muscle length tension relationship. This is the maximum ability of a muscle to develop tension and exert force depending on the length of the muscle. Now, because if you look at a muscle, if you want 100% overlap of all the actin and myosin filaments and the cross bridging. So if we look at the chest here, if we're just standing here in the normal anatomical position or the fundamental position. If we look at the chest muscle, we have 100% overlap there. But what happens if we stretch them back? Now, we'll get maximum tension between 100 and 130% of the, of, of the muscle's resting length. That's where the maximum overlap of those cross bridging comes from. So if we look at that, we have resting length, which is about 100% overlap. As we start to increase lengthen that muscle, we develop a lot of tension. That's what they call active tension. Now, up to about 130%, guess what happens? We get total tension and it increases. It increase, if you increase the length, you get maximum contraction capabilities, but as you lengthen the muscle more, you get even more tension because the muscle is trying to contract or try to keep it from lengthening too much. As the muscle shortens, you see a decrease in total tension. So this should make sense. Concentrically, as you, as you shorten the muscle, the more it shortens, the more the cross bridges or sarcomeres or Z-lines bunch up, so you see a decrease in force production. But this also happens here too, once you get past 130% of the muscle's resting length. 
you'll see the tension go up. The active tension goes down because you have less cross bridging, but the muscles trying to stretch are trying to lengthen and it's trying to keep it there, whatever cross bridging has, to keep it from lengthening even more. Generally pending, the greatest amount of tension can be developed when a muscle is stretched between 100 and 130% of its resting length, which we just talked about. Stretch beyond 100 to 130% of resting length significantly decreases the amount of force muscle can exert. In other words, it decreases the amount of cross bridging the muscle has to develop force. So we, we see that a lot in people trying to do uh, flies and all that. You want to come down where if, you pull, if you're doing a uh, fly, if you come down and pull the shoulder blades together, positions the socket in the right place so the elbow can come just past the shoulder joint a little bit, lengthens the muscle beyond up to about 130% so you get maximum force production to be able to go the other way. Develops tension, maximum overlap of cross bridging, develop force for concentric. When you start going way back there, you're decreasing the amount of cross bridging but the muscle's starting to stretch, so you're going to start transferring um, stress to a lot of connective tissue because the muscle is incapable of producing force because you have less cross bridging. Now, depending on muscle involvement, a proportional decrease in the muscle's ability to develop tension occurs as the muscle is shortened, which we just talked about. When we have shortened the muscle around 50 to 60% of its resting length, we see a substantial decrease in force production because, as you said, the, the uh, Z lines are starting to pull together and it's like everything is bunching up. So you have nothing, the cross bridging can't take place because it's all being bunched up. So once again, we're going to use the typical stretch shortening cycle of a jump. We're going to come down to an optimal position where we lengthen the muscle appropriately to approximately up to its maximum lengthening capacity of about 130%. When we start to go beyond that, we come down here and squat and our heels come off the ground and our knees come forward, our trunk comes up right. This says the gluteus, we're actually at the gluteus maximus by maximally, maximally shortening the hamstrings with knee flexion. So we look at the knees come forward. We're actually loading the quads, actually. But and the, and the, the glutes are working to stabilize everything, too. Stabilize the hip joint. But as we come this way, the hamstrings are lengthening, and so is the glutes. But as we come forward, the hamstrings shorten. So do the glutes to come up this way. We're on the balls of our feet. Our um, gastrocnemius are shortened. But the quads are, are um, lengthened as well, too. Now, for jumping movements, we have to be in a certain position to make sure all the muscles involved in there get, get lengthened, get stretched, and shortened rapidly. If you look at um, Olympic lifters, they do this as they come up here. As they come up through here, pulling the weight off the ground, they do into, into their first pole, then they do a scoop action because as they come off the ground, they're linking their hamstrings. As they get to this position, they'll scoop because they're loading the quads rapidly it stresses and then it can do that triple extension. That is an example of, it, of this, this link tension relationship.